You're not making this any easier for me. <laughs> I want to start with what I have to say. My lip will tremble and bounce. And what I want to say, I don't know how to say it strong enough. I don't know how to say it well enough. But you need to know that in my old age, I'm going to be talking about you. When I'm in the nursing home, which I'm hoping is a little good 30 minutes away. Um, <laughs> when I'm in the nursing home and they're trying to figure out what my addled words are saying or my faint words are saying, you need to know I'll be talking about you. You will have words and stories like thank you. And things like you should have seen them. My, my, my. I'm a citizen of Joplin, which means I've had two great marks placed on my life. The first is a tragedy in a landscape that's impossible to describe. The over 7,000 homes and apartments that are destroyed. As far as you could see, mile wide, seven miles in our city and residential area, as far as you could see, it looked like a lunar landscape. I, I'm a bit of a history buff. I've always wondered what Stalingrad looked like after World War II. And in the middle of it, as we were digging people out, I can never get those images out of my mind. With people crawling out of holes in the ground and digging out of mangled debris as if they were ants, and yet they came out. We begin to hug and cry and hunt and begin to bury our friends. 161 times we did. That's the first mark. But the second mark on our lives is you. I don't know where you say thank you. I don't know what crowd. I, this is the most appropriate place I, I, I know of. By the thousands you came. You came in ones and twos, and you came as families and pickups and SUVs, and you came as busload after busload. We looked up, and there you were. I don't know how you got there so quick. You were right beside us, and you stayed. A great movie with a director and music in the background could not do justice for what it was like to see you. Jesus tells the story of a man from, on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho who's robbed and beaten and stripped naked and left half dead. And a stranger comes by, and the stranger disregarded his own agenda and got off his donkey at personal risk to himself, and... He bandaged the man and he put the man on his own donkey and he walked beside him on that rugged road and he took him to an inn and there he stayed and looked after the man that night. And then he left the innkeeper money and said, this should cover it. And if it doesn't, I'll, you spend whatever you need to on that man because I'll come back through and, and I'll reimburse you. When you wake up in that innkeeper's house, how do you say thank you to that man? You tell me how to say thank you because that's how I'll know how to say thank you to you. For the first time in my life, besides just a little symbolism to other places, for the first time in my life, I know what it's like to be the man on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. <clears throat> to those of you who are just neighbors, and you treated us like neighbors, thank you. And to those of you who hold public office, I'm telling you I am glad to be a citizen of the state of Missouri. It was one of our finest hours. We took care of people who were powerless to look after themselves. And you did it because you cared. On behalf of any of us from the city of Joppa, please know of our applause and our gratitude. Now somebody's going to lean over and say, wow, is he done? <laughs> no, 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 no. You haven't heard me speak before, probably most of you, but I'm not very good as a public speaker, but I try to compensate for it by going long. And, and so... No, there's something else really big we need to talk about, something of significance that has to hit. There's something out of the Joplin experience that's vital for each of us in this room, a reminder, a, a, a stake in the ground. I can't miss. It's an incredibly wonderful stake on the ground. It's something, it's something worth cherishing in your culture. And I'm going to push you a little bit. Do you cherish it in your life? 
When the big things of life happen, the big questions of the soul come to the surface. And a clarity of life occurs. As you realize, we're a pretty affluent culture, and a pretty affluent culture can create for itself a lot of distractions. Distractions that temporarily silence the voice of the soul. You can live building businesses, and you can build being type A personalities. And you can create a life where you just simply hit it running, and that's what you do. You can also create cherished distractions. It causes us not to hear the soul's questions very well. I'm not sure what the motto or theme of our day is, but it might be something along the line of, hey, can you supersize that? And hey, the Netflix are here. And you can live with a quieted, muffled soul. Oh, you'll starve a little bit inside and you'll die a little bit all the time. But, but we're in a culture that can keep throwing activities at it and we can live surface and we can live shallow. But I will tell you, when you find the note on the dresser of a spouse who says, I'm leaving, or when you leave, or the days, and they said it's breast cancer, and you get in the car and head to the daycare to pick up your little kids. Or when they tell you that they're downsizing. They like you, and here's your cake, but we don't have room for you. Or when a mighty wind blows through your town, your soul will ask its biggest questions. You can't live at the Netflix level. And you can't live at the supersized level. And the great questions of life, the ones that drive us, that hunt for clarity, will jump out, leap out, and scream for attention. Those big questions. What I'm going to say to you requires a little interpretation on my side, a little bit of my understanding. And interpreting something and understanding, it's oftentimes a little iffy. I have a grandson um, in Kansas City. He's um, several, but he's, he's, he's four years old. His story has a positive end, so don't, don't panic in it. But he ran across the street last, or a couple of months ago just he went to a neighbor's house, an uh, elderly couple that he's really close with, and he ran across the street without looking well. Well, no traffic was coming and no cars came, and this little four-year-old made it across safely. But his mother, Molly, she took that moment as a teaching moment. And she went to Heath, this little four-year-old, and she said, Heath, you didn't look for the cars. What could have happened? Well, the car could have hit me. That's right. And sweetheart, if a car would have hit you, what could have happened? I could have died. And Molly, this tender mother, got down and this little four-year-old and said, that's right, sweetheart. And if a car hit you and you died, I would think of you every single day of the rest of my life. And I would only have two kids left. And I would miss you. You can't imagine how I would miss you, Heath. Do you understand what I'm saying? And Heath, this little four-year-old, looked up at her and said, So, you're telling me I'm your favorite. Well, my interpretation, I hope, is not quite as far off as his might be, but let me just throw this in. The question you have to wrestle with as a culture and as a people and as individuals is who are we? What am I as a human being? Why am I alive? What is my life for? Everything around me blew away. Am I just a reflection of the stuff around me? Somehow we know we're not just biology, and we understand biology can't explain everything in life. Somehow we intuitively know that. You hold a baby, you hold a baby up here. This baby is just a biological complexion. So many issues biologically. And in this baby, we even know is a temporary biological matter. But you let that baby be in this building, this building come around it, we would tear everything apart. We would rip everything up. Nothing would we save. We would go anything for that child. Why? Because we know intuitively something beyond biology is what life is about. And in the big issues of a storm... Clarity of life and the big issues about life come. I I love Genesis 1. Genesis 1 begins to answer the deepest questions of my life. Who am I? In Genesis 1, you'll notice that when you started, there's an interesting little set of passages, about about 10 or 11 verses in Genesis 1, that are incredibly redundant. I mean, you think if the Lord had a good editor, Genesis 1 would read different. 
because, I mean, do you not have a thesaurus? I mean, I mean, because it keeps saying the same redundant phrase 10 or 11 times in 10 or 11 verses, and everything reproduced after its own kind, 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 after its own kind 11 times or 10 times. And then you realize he wasn't using redundancy. He was using a highlighter. Because in Genesis 1.26, he makes this radical turn. And then God said, let us make man in our image. And in the image of God, he created him male and female. And for the first time in Genesis 1, I began to realize I'm not biology. Oh, I, I, I am biology, but I'm not like anything else on the face of the earth. Everything else on the face of the earth can blow away. Everything else on the earth can fall apart. Everything else, but I am made in the image of God. I'm the shadow of God. Oh, he's the greater light and I'm the lesser. But in that passage, I also figure out who you are. You're not like me in lots of ways. And you don't live where I live. And, and you dress different. You talk different. You talk strange. And... <laughs> I grew up in the state of Missouri. I don't know where you grew up. <laughs> but I figure out who you are. You're somebody made in the image of God. And you have incredible worth and value. And life is not some king on the hill. Let's see if you can achieve something. If you can achieve something, you matter. And if you don't achieve enough, you don't quite matter. If you can hit a golf ball long enough, you matter. If you can hit a baseball over a fence far enough, you matter. If you can make enough money, you matter. If you can have high enough position, you matter. And suddenly I realized, oh, no, that's true. You may be the special needs individual who sits at that table. And you have limitations, but you are the shadow of the living God. You're part of the majesty and the wonder of who he is. And part of his own glory passes by when I see you. And I wake up in a town in turmoil and I know who I am. And I know everything else can blow away and I'm not it. There are people in this room with incredible scars in your past. All kinds of things. I, I could bring up, for some of the men here, I could bring up a woman's name and, and you would feel like you were shot in the gut. For some of the women here, I could bring up a guy's name and you just feel like you were beaten up again because of something out of a scar of the past. It's kind of funny about that. You take something made in the image of God, it is really hard to lessen that. If I had a $100 bill in my pocket and I don't, who would be wise? I mean, who would be dumb enough to bring a $100 bill to Jeff City? <laughs> but, <laughs> I may have gone to a wonder country school, but we figured some things out pretty quickly. I'm telling you. But that's the funny thing. I could take that $100 bill and I could water it up, spit on it, put it on the ground. I could rub my, my foot on it. I could do whatever I want to. I, 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 could, I could do what I want to. What, what, what's the $100 bill worth now? And the answer is it's still worth $100. Because I didn't set its value and I can't take its value away. Somebody else set its value. The living God made you in his image. This issue this is, is, is not just trite stuff. It's big, big stuff. I'll never forget the day that one of my granddaughters, uh, she wasn't quite two. It was the day she discovered her shadow belonged to her. I just took her joyriding on a little lawnmower, driving around the yard on a spring day, just letting this little almost two-year-old have her go-kart. And as we were riding around. It was the day that she saw it and she began to wave at it and wave back to her and, and, and she giggled and she laughed and I would turn and she lost her shadow and, and then it was behind her and, and, and one of the greatest delights of my heart was the day of that little granddaughter on my lap discovering that. Can I tell you spiritually the greatest day of my life was when I figured out I'm the shadow of the living God who loves me and I was made for a relationship with him. I am made to reflect his glory and I will be accountable to him and you are people made in his glory and you are my charge and my care on his behalf. There's a profound sense of peace when you discover that. There's a profound sense of peace. When, I, when our kids were little, we had a book we read to them. It was entitled something along the line of The Little Boy Who Lost His Shadow. It actually was the other way around. The story was about a shadow that got lost from his little boy. And the shadow couldn't figure out where he belonged. 
and the shadow would go next to a tree and he didn't fit there and he would go next to a building and he didn't fit there and he tried to go next to this and he didn't fit there and the, and the shadow went everywhere and the shadow became more and more distorted and more and more changed until he found where he belonged. I will tell you the reason I love this culture and the reason I love this state and I love what we have because we've been given a blessing, we've been given an insight and we get to live among neighbors who seem to know who we are and they treat us that way and we get a chance to treat each other that way. That isn't always the case. There's a little tribal group that I, I know a little bit about in Southeast Asia. You go into the marketplace and your heart breaks. You'll never see more forlorn, dirty, poor individuals coming to a marketplace. They come in and they will not look you in the eye and their heads are down and it's, it's, it's even past anything out of the oriental cultures that you might imagine. I've never seen a, a group of people in greater despair and you ask them, who are you and where did you come from? And they tell you the story of who they are and, and their story of who they believe they are is lived out in how they live their life. It is an incredibly broken story. Go down here to the mall. Take a look at that little empty-eyed young girl walking there. The girl, with, maybe with the angry the chip on her shoulder, maybe it's just the hollow face. You ask her who she believes she is, and when the shadow gets lost from its creator, your identity gets lost, and you don't know who you are, and life is incredibly hard, and it becomes very painful. Whole cultures do that, you know. Whole cultures get lost. I have a dear, dear friend in Southeast Asia. Obviously, in a public place like this, I cannot give his name and cannot give the country. But it is a country that the knowledge of God is, is, is so shoved against. And so, therefore, the knowledge of who they are is so shoved against. This man grew up with war. He hates war. This man was set free by the knowledge of who the living God is. And he became a gentle day worker, just a day worker to go back into his own country and to help them know. I've known that man for years. I asked him what he was doing. He was setting, his answer is, I'm setting people free. He said, my whole life I lived with fear. My whole life I fe lived with anger. For my whole life it was tribal. I couldn't see anything except, and for the first time I know who I am, I'm set free. Five years ago, January the 18th, his government came in the middle of the night and they took him. And my friend is either in a shallow grave or he's in an unmarked prison somewhere. And he went into it with his eyes wide open. He knew, told his wife, kissed her and his two sons and told them, I know, but you've got to set people free. They have to know who they are. In 2003, 2004, I was in a war-torn Central, Central Asia country. There's an orphanage there. It has 600 boys in it. Right beside it, pretty close, is another orphanage with 800 boys. You go to either orphanages and you will find five to six workers that are there. The only three, the only three that lived among them were three American college students who took a year off to go live in this orphanage and just lived there. They camped outside. They told stories. Their stories were pretty simple. Their stories were these. You would see a boy and you would learn his name and you would call him by name and an eighth grade boy would begin to bawl and, and cry and hug you because no adult had ever called him by name. He had never had a name from anybody. How can a culture become so dark that those are the kinds of things, if you don't know who God is, or if you have a wrong view of who Jesus revealed God to be, then you get a wrong view of humanity and the shadow becomes distorted. No wonder we live that way. We're in a world where to love our neighbor is a bit instinctive. Everybody, believer and unbeliever, is made alike in the image of God. The same way that everybody has a, a nose with a sense of smell, God gave some sense of, of, of love and compassion to every person on the face of the earth. But if you begin to get lost from the source of that Creator, if you do not live with Him, if you do not know Him, if you do not pursue Him, bit by bit, your own life will become more distorted and you're less and less and your love will become tribal. It's your group and your circle and your people, 
And you will live with one of the blackest hearts, thinking you're doing good when you lost the image of the living God. Micah 6.8 is an incredible passage. I love it. Micah 6.8 is a passage that if you make list, you, you'll make it wrong. It's not, it's not a list. <coughs> Micah 6.8 says, what does the Lord require of you? But to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What you don't know is in the system of how they wrote within Jewish writing. You, you've got to kind of flip this whole thing. Here's what it basically says this. You need to know that it's symbiotic. You walk humbly with your God, and you will act justly, and you will love mercy. But if you break down walking humbly with your God, and you depend upon your own character, I promise you, we all leak. We all leak. We all have enough scars. Our hearts lie to us. I could justify a murder in the parking lot if you give me long enough to think on it, get embittered about it. I'm made in the image of God, but I do not live up to the nature of God if I do not walk with God. So what do I want? What do I want out of a citizen? What do I want in a neighborhood when I'm talking to, to, to the government of the state of Missouri? I want you to be people who know your God. Because if you do, your soul, your soul finds its shape. And you will love mercy. And you will act justly. Now that's not easy and there'll be disagreements. And you're not sure how to do that. And you'll search hard. But knowing the Lord shapes us. I realize what we have here. And I'll try to wrap this up. I realize what we have here is incredibly dangerous for lots of people as they see it. To have a preacher and a governor side by side. <laughs> He is so corrupting to me. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Or something like that. I forget how that goes. You, you need to know. You say, how do faith and politics go together? I, I can tell you, quite frankly, you don't want me without faith. Because without the faith, I couldn't stand behind some of the most precious words we have that I realize that all men are created equal, are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. You don't want me. My faith has to drive me because it's my faith that causes me to love mercy and to have justice and compassion and courage. And without the knowledge of the living God, I'm just a shadow who got lost and I will be distorted and become something, but you do not know what I will become. I will love my own. But the man in the ditch on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is not safe with me. It was Governor Nixon who I will finish with. When he did meet with the preachers, Everybody was trying to figure out what you do, and we were all scrambling. This is new territory for everybody, at least at the volume we were having it. And one of the preachers asked him at the end, he said, do you have any other questions? And one of the preachers said, Governor Nixon, do you have any advice for us? What, what do we do? What do we do? And, and his answer uh, was... was Simple and profound. He looked at about a hundred preachers sitting there and he said, I don't want you gentlemen to get excessively involved with the relief efforts. I don't want you to spend all your time on pallets and convoys of things. He said, the people of this town won't get well. They won't recover from anything we can send on a pallet. He said, there's a well, you're going to have to go and you're going to have to drink deep out of that well and you're going to have to know that well and there's water from that well that you're going to have to take. And you take that water from that well and it will give healing. I want to say to an American government that struggles on what you do with faith, you cannot have the water without the well. You cannot have the vine without the root. You cannot have the attributes without the author. You cannot geld the stallion and then bid it to reproduce. It is in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, from my perspective. It's the knowledge at least of this personal God who loves us and knows us and 
Scripture says he's even written my name on the palm of his hand. This tattooed God with my name on it. This God who loves me and said, I tore off a part of myself and I made you in my image. And you get to live on my behalf for the good of your neighbors. No, you cannot ever separate faith and politics. Politics always knows that you take good care of your neighbor. The problem is, it's only by faith that I figure out who my neighbor is, and it's far more than I think. And it's only in faith I figure out even what's good for my neighbor. On behalf of a group of people from Joplin, Missouri, you made incredible neighbors. You looked an awful lot like God.